Okay, I think the number of audience is not increasing, so I think we can start. Good evening, everyone, and thank you for joining us. Today, we have Dr. Sanjeev, interventional cardiologist from Rashid Hospital in Dubai. Dr. Sanjeev is going to speak to that tonight about uh, omega-3 fatty acid and day-to-day -day clinical practice. First, we will, uh, Dr. Sanjeev is going to give a lecture. It will take between 45 to 50 minutes, and then we will have last 10 minutes for a question from the audience. So please, for the audience, uh, post your question, and then we will discuss them at the end of the lecture. Dr. Sanjeev, you may start. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdullah. Let me share my screen first and set the things all right. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah, okay. So thank you very much, uh, all the dear Dr. Abdullah and uh, all the dear friends. Uh, my sincere thanks to Embed Society of Internal and Medicine for giving me the opportunity to speak about this important subject. In fact, about uh, a month back when I was discussing with Dr. Jamila, we felt that the current practice of prescribing the omega-3 fatty acids um, is not currently in alignment uh, with the latest guidelines and the latest recommendations. So it will be important uh, to talk about what are the latest recommendations because in last uh, approximately one decade, there have been the tremendous interest in omega-3 fatty acid and lot of the new trials have come up. So I'll be presenting all that scientific evidence today. Uh, so as they say before flying, that fasten your sealed belt. So I say that um, be alert and enjoy this journey of presentation today. Uh, so what is omega-3 fatty acids? Uh, omega-3 fatty acids, these are uh, why they are called as the three because of the carbon carbon double bond at the position three it's very simple these are essential fatty acids because they are not manufactured in the human body uh, sorry they are not manufactured in the human body and the alpha linolenic acid is the prototype molecule there, which is called as a ALA in short, and it comes from the vegetable kingdom. And there are other two important molecules, icosapentaenoic acid, so we call it EPA, and docosahexaenoic acid, which we call it as DHA, and the sources of these two of them is exclusively from the marine source. So there is a close cousin of omega-3 polyunsaturated fatty acids, which are called as the omega-6 uh, also. And uh, omega-6 uh, PUFA or polyunsaturated fatty acids. And why they are six? Because the first carbon-carbon double bond it has position six in this long chain fatty acids. And the linoleic acid is the prototype molecule. The dietary sources are the most of the oils which we consume, like the corn oil, sunflower oil, safflower oil, or the soya oil, they all contain uh, linoleic acid. The linoleic acid gets converted into the body to the arachidonic acid. It's a very tightly controlled step in the human body. And many of us might have heard about arachidonic acid while studying the platelets and the aspirin that the platelet inhibits the COX-1 and the COX-2 and uh, prevents the conversion of arachidonic acid into the thromboxan A2. So this is the same arachidonic acid which comes from the N6 PUFA. So this arachidonic acid, this is uh, pro-inflammatory and vasoconstrictive and pro-aggregatory because uh, it enhances the platelet aggregation by uh, by, uh, by leading the formation of the prostaglandin E2, thromboxone A2, and leukotriene 
B4, but it, there is a little bit of the, uh, you know, um, uh, things on the other side also, because it, it plays a role as the anti-inflammatory and the anti-aggregatory agent also, because in the vascular endothelium, it generates the prostacycline, which is a vasodilatory prostaglandin, and lipoxin A4 and some other acids also. So this is so much about uh, omega-3 and omega-6 uh, polyunsaturated fatty acid. And uh, this evening we are talking about omega-3 uh, PUFA there. So what are the sources? Uh, the sources of the ALA or the uh, uh, alpha linolenic acid is the flaxseed, walnut, pumpkin seed, and the canola oil. Um, and uh, there are the, this, uh, this gets converted into the human body to a very limited extent into the EPA and DHA because the rate limiting step is this desaturase enzyme over there in the human body. So most of the time, uh, we have to take uh, the EPA and the DHA uh, in the diet, and it is exclusively from the oily or the fatty fish because the fish they eat on the phytoplanktons and the phytoplanktons they take the algae and the marine algae they synthesize uh, these polyunsaturated fatty acids so so through this uh, marine ecosystem these uh, uh, omega 3 fatty acids they reach the human beings so what are the differences between the EPA and the DHA there are certain differences and that's the reason of their biological uh, effect also is different both of them they reduce the triglyceride they are very well known that uh, omega-3 fatty acid they reduce the triglyceride but as far as the LDL cholesterol is concerned it is known that the mixture of them EPA plus DHA or let us say the mixture omega-3 fatty acid they increase the LDL cholesterol somewhere from six to ten percent so how the triglycerides are uh, reduced, they cause the more rapid clearance of the LDL particles and the slower production of VLDL uh, over there by stimulating the lipoprotein lipase, which causes the decrease in the production and the increased clearance of the triglyceride-rich lipoproteins. The pure EPA, it reduces much more uh, high-sensitive CRP which is a marker of the systemic inflammation, while the mixture EPA plus DHA, it does not affect much on high sensitive CRP. It reduces the FOC3, which enhances the atherosclerosis. It uh, increases the nitric oxide secretion and causes the vasodilatation, while there is less response with the mixture omega-3 fatty acid. And it has been seen that when the HDL is rich in the EPA, there is more reverse cholesterol transport uh, by this HDL as compared to the ordinary HDL. So uh, from monocytes, the reverse cholesterol transport is also enhanced by the HDL, which is rich in the EPA there. So these are the, some of the basic differences between these two molecules there. So what are the physiologic effects? How do they work? Uh, they affect on heart by reducing the heart rate, reducing the propensity for the arrhythmia, improvement of the myocardial efficiency because they cause a little bit of the uh, decrease in the, um, you know, uh, the uh, uh, oxygen consumption over there increases the left ventricular diastolic fling, increases the autonomic function, and increases the uh, parasympathetic tone over there. Uh, in liver, they reduce the triglyceride production. In the vascular system, they have several effects, like they reduce the systemic vascular resistance, they cause the vasodilatation, they increase the arterial compliance, and uh, improves the endothelial function significantly. So when the large dose is uh, omega-3 fatty acid is taken, they reduce the thrombosis. And that's the reason that some of the patients, they do come with the bruises on the body and they reduce the production of the arachidonic acid-derived eicosanoids. 
increase the production of the omega-3 derived metabolites and that they help in the platelet deaggregation and it's an important effect to remember over there. So what's their daily intake? The daily intake by the healthy individual ranges from somewhere from 500 to 750 milligram per day, which is equal to about two to three gram per week in the normal individual and maybe around four gram per week, four to five gram per week in the patients, in the persons who are at high risk of having cardiovascular problems. So do all the fish contain uh, omega-3 fatty acid? Not all the fish contains. Uh, you see over here, the fish can be divided into two varieties. One which is called as the oily fish, which contains more than one gram of uh, omega-3 fatty acids per 100 gram. And the second is the lean fish, which contains less than, um, uh, uh, less than uh, one gram of uh, omega-3 fatty acid per 100 gram. So you see the, some of the varieties of the salmon, mackerel, herring, whitefish, trout, and the albacore tuna. They are very rich in omega-3 fatty acids, while some other fish, like the grouper or the which is called the hamur over here, the cod, which are commonly consumed into this region also, halibut, they are very poor in omega-3 fatty acids. So not all the fish, they are equal. And what is this red color over there for the swordfish? Because the swordfish is known to accumulate the maximum amount of the methyl mercury out of all these fishes. So this is red in color over there. So do the fish reduce the cardiovascular endpoints? This is not uh, universally, you know, uh, the, the, the final position in all the trials. So like when we see this Danish trial of... Uh, just one second. Yeah, when you see this Danish trial of uh, 55,000 patients, which were followed up for a period of 7.6 years, uh, then... Uh, and uh, the relationship of uh, fish intake with acute coronary syndrome was seen. It was seen the beneficial effect is confined only to the people who, who are taking the uh, fatty fish or the oily fish and not to the lean fish intake. And there also, there are the sex differences because the benefit was more seen into the males as compared into the female. And remember, it's a very large uh, study over there. Uh, so, and it, and what was seen also that if the fish intake is increased to beyond six grams per day, which works about, let us say, the two servings uh, per week or a total of 100 grams per week, uh, there is no significant uh, increase in the protection. So, this is what uh, is the two servings per week, it comes into the guidelines. Uh, then uh, we have already talked about uh, the uh, mercury because the fishes, uh, they do accumulate not only the mercury, but many other dioxins and uh, other pollutants from the sea and some of the fish which are long lived like king mackerel, swordfish, shark, tilefish and albacore tuna. They are known to accumulate a lot of the mercury. So we have to remember this also over there. Apart from this, uh, if you take the lean fish like uh, halibut and take the oily fish also, the salmon, so this shows here. Salmon and halibut, then you see the cholesterol content. Uh, they contain roughly half of the cholesterol what the chicken, uh, what is present in the chicken. So the cholesterol content of the chicken is roughly about 85 milligram per 100 gram. And what is there in the salmon and the halibut is in the range of 40 to 63 milligrams. So excess intake of the lean fish especially, which is not providing the omega-3 fatty acid, uh, there is a substantial amount of the cholesterol intake also associated with it. Uh, you can see that some of the shellfish, lobster, and the shrimps, 
they are very high in the cholesterol content and that is the reason to our patients uh, for the secondary prevention when we advise the fish we don't recommend them the shellfish consumption over there so what the guidelines say uh, this is from the 2021 european society of the uh, cardiology guidelines on the cardiovascular disease prevention what it says over here in the green uh, that it is recommended to eat the fish preferably, preferably the fatty fish at least once a week at least once a week and this is a class 1b recommendation so if i see the 2021 guidelines and compare it with the 2012 guidelines then you see in the 2012 guidelines the recommendation was the fish at least twice a week one of which to be the oily fish so uh, i feel that even in the guidelines over a period of the last uh, 8 to 10 years, there has been some change in the wording as far as the fish intake is concerned over there. So how do, suppose if I don't take the fish, can I take the fish oil? And if I take the fish oil, uh, is it like the same as if I would have consumed the fish? So into this small study on the human volunteers, uh, they were given uh, salmon, uh, two servings per week and the equal amount of the fish oil as the capsule and at the end of the 16 weeks it was seen the EPA and the DHA incorporation into the RBC was similar into the two groups so who were taking the fish or who were taking the fish oil so whether you are taking the fish or the fish oil it does not matter over there and the different components of the lipoproteins so they were also almost similarly affected in both the groups of the fish or the fish oil groups uh, there. So now let us talk about the role of fish oil, because if I don't take the fish, or if I am scared of the methyl mercury, or if I want to control the dietary cholesterol strictly and have the cardiovascular benefits, then can I take the fish oil in place of the fish? I mean, this is an unsettled question and we, we are going to deal about it today. But before that, uh, let me talk that there are three types of the fish oils which are commercially available for the prescription into the market. One is the combination of the uh, combination of the EPA and DHA as the ethyl ester, which is the most commonly available in the UAE market as Omacor. The second is omega-3 carboxylic acids, which were available previously as the EPANOVA. And the another one which has become recently available is the purified EPA preparation, uh, which is called as the icosa pentethyl or the VASEPA over there. So why I am talking about it? Um, there were some trials which were conducted with the omega-3 carboxylic fatty acids, and that particular trial failed. And then the industry people, they started coming to us and our colleagues and saying that, no, no, this trial was conducted with the carboxylic acid and the carboxylic acid omegas are different from the ethyl ester omega. So I thought, let me clear this confusion over here that the omega-3 carboxylic acid and the ethyl esters, which are uh, available now, they are the same. And the carboxylic acid molecule was a novel molecule, which was developed in such a fashion that it does not, it did not require the intake with the high fat food because the omega-3 carboxylic acid, they do not require the hydrolysis in the gut by pancreatic lipase for their absorption. So if you are taking a low fat meal, so you see this in the blue, omega-3 carboxylic acid are perfectly well absorbed over there. But in the green, this is the ethyl esters, which are not so well absorbed. While if you have taken a high fat diet, then the absorption of the carboxylic acid and the ethyl esters, they are perfectly the same. So in the proof of the concept trials, a dose of the four gram per day of omega-3 carboxylic acid it produced a similar increase in the plasma EPA along with DHA as the four gram per day dose of purified EPA. So as far as their absorption and the metabolism is concerned, there are practically no differences over there. 
So we will discuss now the role of the omega-3 fatty acid in the health and disease. In this context, we will discuss the uh, role of the mixture omega-3 fatty acid, that is the mixture of the EPA and DHA, and compare it with the pure EPA. Then their role in the primary prevention, in secondary prevention, in the diabetic patient, in non-diabetic patients, and their use as a triglyceride-lowering drug, and their use in the cardiovascular risk reduction. So let us first talk about the role um, of the mixture omega-3 fatty acids into the primary prevention. So this came from the VITAL trial, which was a huge trial of the 26,000 patients conducted in the United States and reported in New England Journal of the Medicine in 2019. And the patients were followed up for it. These are not the patients, rather the healthy subjects. They were followed up for a period of six years. It was a placebo-controlled trial rigorously done. Uh, these people, they were given the vitamin D3 uh, and the marine omega-3 fatty acids uh, mixture, one gram per day. More than 50 years male or more than 55 years female. And the primary endpoint was a major uh, cardiovascular event. And the secondary endpoint was the individual component of these major events. So they were looking into the any invasive cancer because, uh, you know, uh, the omega-3 fatty acids are being consumed by the general public under the notion and are be being used by some of the physician with the notion that possibly they reduce the um, uh, cancer incidence into the general public. So all the baseline characteristics, they were very well matched in the omega-3 and the placebo group. So let us see what happens. Uh, when omega-3 fatty acids are consumed as a supplemental agent by the general public. After a period of the six years, uh, there was absolutely no difference in the major cardiovascular events uh, as compared to the placebo and absolutely no difference into the invasive cancer of any time over a period of six years uh, period. So the conclusion was supplementation of the omega-3 fatty acid did not result in the lower incidence of the major cardiovascular events of the cancer than placebo. So the use of the mixture omega-3 fatty acids into a normal healthy population is not recommended. Now let us uh, see the same people but who have been having the pre-diabetes or diabetes because in the vital trial the number of the persons who were having diabetes was only the 14%. So in the Ascendi study, which was a very large 15,500 patients study, they collected only, they took only, enrolled only the diabetic patients, but without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. So this is the, uh, the patient of the diabetes, which is walking in the endocrinology or the diabetic clinic and they were giving one gram capsule containing the mixture omega-3 fatty acid and compared with the placebo and the placebo was the olive oil over here. 54% uh, of the patients for the current or the former, former smokers. Systolic blood pressure more than 140 millimeter of the mercury in quarter of the patient and the study they were follow up of the 7.4 years. Primary composite endpoint was the first serious vascular event and the secondary composite, secondary endpoint was the first serious vascular event or any arterial revascularization. And all the components of the cardiovascular endpoint, non-fatal MI, stroke, TIA, vascular death, they were all included into the primary composite endpoint. So at the end of the 7.4 years, what happens? There was absolutely no difference between the omega-3 fatty acid as compared to the placebo in the diabetic patients over there. When the individual components were seen, there was no difference in the individual component. They could not achieve the statistical significance either into the individual component or the serious vascular event or the secondary endpoint of the serious vascular event or the revascularization. They also looked into the fatal and non-fatal cancer and there was no significant between group differences in the cancer. So no difference in the primary composite endpoint, no difference in the secondary endpoint, no difference in the cancer. 
in the diabetic patients without atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease. And what the author said, the recommendations to increase the fish intake are based on observational evidence. But the randomized trials of the supplements have largely not shown the cardiovascular benefit. In conclusion, among the patients with the diabetes but without evidence of the cardiovascular disease at baseline, there was no significant difference in the incidence of serious vascular events between those who received omega-3 fatty acids and those who received placebo. These findings, together with the result of either randomized trials involving the patient with or those without diabetes, do not support the current recommendation for the routine dietary supplementation with omega-3 fatty acid to prevent the vascular events. Now let us see other group of the patients. They were also given the mixture omega-3 fatty acids. But these patients, they were a little bit more sicker because these trials, they included the patients who were having atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease also in addition to the diabetes. So this is the primary plus the secondary prevention trial. And this data, it came from the origin trial on the role of the omega-3 fatty acid. This was also a double-blind and placebo-controlled study and many of our colleagues in the endocrine uh, who are doing the uh, uh, who are treating the diabetic patients may remember this trial because this was also a two is to two, uh, two into two factorial design, and uh, uh, the the half of the patient they were giving the glargine. This was in fact a trial for the studying the effect of the glargine compared to the standard of the care in the diabetes, but it included. Uh, uh, the into this design, uh, the omega-3 fatty acid, uh, one gram per day compared to the placebo. Again, the olive oil over here, 12,500 patient follow-up of 6.2 years uh, over there. And the primary outcome was a cardiovascular death. And as I said, these were the high-risk patient because about 59% of the patient, they had the previous myocardial infarction 80%, they had the hypertension, BMI was 30, um, uh, the, the mean BMI, and the 12% were current smoker, 15% of them had the even micro or the macro albuminuria. Uh, the, they, the placebo and the omega-3 arm, they had the similar baseline characteristic. Trial was for six years, at the end of the six year, there was absolutely no difference in the primary composite at point of the death from the cardiovascular causes compared with the placebo. And what we say the hard end points, which are called as a myocardial infarction, stroke, and the cardiovascular death. Because if you remember, some of the trials on the omega-3 fatty acids, which were carried out about uh, two and a half decade back, GC Prevention, in that particular trial, they projected omega-3 fatty acid, they reduce mortality, cardiovascular mortality, they reduce the arrhythmic deaths. Uh, that was the main finding in this trial. So they looked into the MI stroke and the cardiovascular death, and there was absolutely no difference at, at any time point between the omega-3 and the placebo arm over there in these patients. So death from any cause, the individual components, and the death from the arrhythmia, they were also analyzed, and there was absolutely no difference between the omega-3 fatty acid versus the placebo. Possibly the olive oil was doing a very good job over there, or the omega-3 fatty acids, they are not working for such type of the population. Uh, so if you see, uh, the important, a few important things from the origin trial, uh, there was a reduction in the, uh, in the, in the systolic and the diastolic blood pressure, but uh, possibly with the uh, improvement in the health during the trial period, there was an equal reduction in the blood pressure in the placebo arm over there also. As I said in the beginning that um, omega-3 fatty acids, they have a physiological role in reducing the heart rate. So there was a little bit of the reduction of the 
heart rate over there and uh, um, there was a reduction in the total cholesterol the there was a reduction in the ldl cholesterol there was there was almost no change in the hdl cholesterol but the significant reduction in the triglyceride so the point to note is though the triglycerides were reduced to a significant extent over a period of the time in these diabetic patients with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, but with the mixture omega-3 fatty acid, as far as the endpoints were concerned, there was absolutely no change over there. So the dietary supplementation of one gram of the omega-3 fatty acid did not reduce the rate of cardiovascular event in the patient at high risk for cardiovascular events. So now, some of the investigators thought that we have seen almost all the group of the patients. But in the meantime, there was some data which was available uh, about the dose response relationship uh, of with omega-3 fatty acids. So in this particular study, which was published over here, you see that reduction in the systolic blood pressure and the diastolic blood pressure is having a dose response relationship and the maximum reduction is seen with a dose of roughly three to four gram per day of omega-3 fatty acids similarly in this busy slide if you see in the top over there the triglycerides if you don't take the omega-3 fatty acid, then 237. If you take about a gram per day, then it is reduced to 200, 215. But if you are taking 3.4 gram per day, then the triglycerides are reduced to 173. That means the triglyceride reduction is also having a dose response relationship. You increase the dose, better the response. And this achieves the statistical significance for the triglyceride reduction over there. So what they thought, in vital trial, ascent trial, origin trial, only the one gram per day of omega-3 fatty acids have been used. Let us jack up the dose. So they increased the dose over there. And they took the same group of the patient in, and they gave the mixture omega-3 fatty acids, the group of the patient for primary and secondary prevention. And they were having either the pre-diabetes and diabetes. So that is how the strength trial was designed, which is a very famous trial uh, reported in 2020, double-blind, placebo-controlled, randomized trial. And in this particular trial, the placebo was the corn oil in place of the olive oil, which was used in all the three previous trials. It was also a multi-center trial comparing four gram per day of omega-3 carboxylic acid uh, these patients, they, they were receiving the treatment like we do today. Almost all the patients, they were on the statins, high-dose statins, because these were having the high cardiovascular risk. And they were having the high triglyceride level and the low HDL cholesterol level. So they have chosen in the strength trial their patients very carefully. Because if you remember, there was a trial, a called lipid trial, in which the phenofibrate was used and they did not see any difference um, uh, between the phenofibrate and the placebo arm. Only in a post hoc analysis, they showed some benefit in the group in Accord lipid trial, uh, the group which was having increase in the triglycerides and a low HDL cholesterol. So taking a cue from the Accord lipid trial, the investigators have chosen the patients which were having the high triglyceride and the low HDL cholesterol. The huge trial, 13,000 patients in 22 countries, almost all over the world, mean age 63 years, 35% women, 70% diabetics, 56% had atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, and very well treated with the statin therapy like our currently treated patients. LDL cholesterol at the baseline, 75 only, triglyceride, 240, HDL cholesterol, low, 36, and HSCRP, 
2.1, so borderline high. The two is the cutoff over there. And the primary efficacy measured. So they, they choose and the five composite endpoints over there, the five points. So that, um, uh, you know, in the composite endpoints, if you enter more variables, then there is a more possibility that you may find out some sort of the difference in these trials between the active and the placebo arm. So they took the five endpoints and followed up the patients at the end of the trial. They did not find any difference in the five-point maze in the omega-3 carboxylic acid arm versus the corn oil arm. And the core maze of the three-point hard end points, there was absolutely no difference over there. So this happened with the four gram per day. With the four gram per day of the omega-3 fatty acids, there was a decrease in the total cholesterol but there was a little bit of the increase in the LDL cholesterol. As I said in the beginning, the combination of the EPA and DHA, it increases the LDL cholesterol to an extent of 6 to 10%. Um, in the placebo arm, there was a little bit of the fall in the LDL cholesterol, possibly as a result of the increase, better follow-up in this patient. There was a significant reduction in the triglyceride in the omega-3 fatty acid arm. And there was a significant reduction in the HSCRP in spite of all the positive biochemical parameters, the cardiovascular endpoints, they did not improve over there. And then there was no separation of the curves at, at a median of three years. And the trial had to be stopped prematurely because um, whatever number of the events they wanted to collect, they got collected within and they were uh, the investigators and the committees, they thought that uh, there is no need to continue the trial that because um, there won't be any difference between uh, the placebo as well as the omega-3 arm, even if the trial is continued for more number of the years. And what was happening that in the active treatment arm, there was more risk of paroxysmal atrial fibrillation, which was statistically significant. So if you are using one gram of the omega-3 fatty acid, there is no increase in the atrial fibrillation. But if you jack up the dose to four gram per day, then there is an increase in the atrial fibrillation over there. There are the greater rates of the GI adverse event and the study drug discontinuation. So theoretically, the lack of the cardiovascular and the interpretation for the first time from this trial was Theoretically, the lack of the cardiovascular benefits with the omega-3 carboxylic acid could reflect the adverse effects from the co-administration of the DHA. And for my colleagues, this DHA does not mean the way health authority, it's the DHA docosahexaenoic acid. All right. So this trial also did not prove any significant benefit. Um, now let us see, we have seen only uh, the uh, patients in which we saw the primary as well as the secondary prevention. Let's see more sicker patients and only the secondary prevention. You know, the post myocardial infarction, post stroke, post PAD type of the patient for the reduction of the cardiovascular endpoints in which many of my colleagues, they do prescribe the omega-3 fatty acids. So this is the OMEGA trial. This is a fairly big trial of 3,800 patients. It was conducted in Germany. All the patients after acute myocardial infarction, three to 14 days after acute myocardial infarction, they were given either the one gram per day of ethyl ester mixture omega-3 fatty acid or the placebo as the olive oil over there. The primary endpoint, sudden cardiac death, and the secondary endpoint, total mortality and the non-fatal clinical events. Mean age 64 years, 77, 78% patient had the PCI. And if you see the previous MI, 15%, previous stroke, 5%, and the PAD, 6%, that means uh, roughly about 26% of the patient, they had a previous event also. So very high risk group patient, 35% smokers, is in 94% of the patients. And what happened? There was no difference between the omega-3 and the placebo arm um, as far as the survival, sudden cardiac death, uh, total mortality, anything over there. 
So again, um, in Norway, a group of the investigators, they thought in the, for the secondary prevention, let us increase the dose and let us see, maybe in secondary prevention, this mixture omega-3 fatty acids are useful. But this is the OMEMI trial, which was published recently in circulation. And this was a thousand patient trial. It was two gram of omega-3 fatty acid versus placebo. Uh, and you see there was absolutely no difference as far as the primary outcome and the all-cause mortality. And with uh, two gram of the omega-3 fatty acid per day, there was an increase in the atrial fibrillation in the omega-3 arm. The hazard ratio was 1.84 for atrial fibrillation. It, it was statistically significant. So now, uh, we have seen the role in the primary prevention, in mixed type of the patient, in secondary prevention. So let us summarize uh, whatever we have learned till now. Uh, so this summary is in the two parts. The no evidence, there, is, there was no evidence of the benefit of the mixture omega-3 fatty acid in the low dose. In healthy persons for primary prevention, in pre-diabetic and diabetic for primary prevention, in pre-diabetic and diabetic for primary and the secondary prevention, and also only if you are giving for secondary prevention. And there are no evidence of benefit of the mixture omega-3 fatty acid in high dose, in high-risk cardiovascular patient with diabetes for primary or secondary prevention, in the high-risk cardiovascular patient after MI for secondary prevention. So in all these scenarios, there was absolutely no benefit. But if you see this particular slide carefully, what is the common thing which you see is mixture omega-3 fatty acid. That everything kept on changing over there, but one thing did not change. That was the type of the omega-3 fatty acid. So let us see now that if you change the type of the omega-3 fatty acid, the patients are given pure EPA preparation, but not the mixture type of the omega-3 fatty acid. So there were some trials or some data which is available in this regard. And these there are two trials which are very important available, and they included the patient for the primary and the secondary prevention. The first one of this is the Japan EPA lipid study, which is very famous, though it's an old trial, but it is still relevant today, this JALIS trial. It was a large trial conducted in Japan, 18,500 patients, 80% patient primary prevention, 20% patient secondary prevention, 60 years of age, 70% females, very low number of the diabetes. It was started somewhere around in year 2000, and these people, they were recruited in the clinics, uh, in the Japanese physicians. During those times, uh, triglycerides, 153, LDL cholesterol was 182, mean LDL cholesterol. And very small dose of the statins were being used. Uh, I think many of my colleagues may laugh. The starting dose was 5 milligram symbiostatin and 10 milligram or 10 milligram of the pravastatin, which was allowed during those times in year 2000 you know, which was uptitrated to 10 milligram and slowly uptitrated to 20 milligram of the private statin. Open level study, and they were used 1,800 milligram of the pure EPA ethyl ester. Uh, there was no comparator arm. Uh, comparator arm was open level statin only arm, five years of the follow-up. And the, it was the Japanese study who, the Japanese population, they have the very, high fish intake. And what happened at the end of the five years, there was 19% relative risk reduction. Oh God, for the first time in my presentation, we are seeing something positive over there. In the EPA arm, there was 19% relative risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint, which is any major coronary event, including sudden cardiac death, fatal, and non-fatal myocardial infarction or other non-fatal event, including unstable angina, PCI or CABG. You don't want to send your patients for PCI and CABG. You don't want them to come back for PCI, CABG again. 
So there was a reduction in all those events over there. However, when they analyzed the results separately of the primary prevention arm, which was the 80% of the patient, out of 18,000, 16,000 roughly the patient, the, uh, it was not statistically significant. The hazard, there was only 18% reduction, but it did not achieve a statistical significance. And the secondary prevention arm could achieve the statistical significance. So in a post hoc analysis, what they saw that in the primary prevention arm, if you select the patients which were high risk group and which were the high risk group patients, these were the patients, uh, which were the high risk group persons, and these were the persons who were having high triglycerides, more than 150 and low HDL cholesterol, then they were the highest risk patients, persons over there. And in these highest risk persons, the use of 1.8 gram per day of pure EPA reduced the primary composite endpoint by 53%. So it was a post hoc analysis, but it showed benefit over there. However, there were the several limitations of the JALIS study because it was an open interventional, open intervention study. There was no placebo control. 20% of the patients were only secondary prevention now. There were very low diabetic patient. The patients were not on the contemporary treatment like what we use now. Very low dose of the statin, two third of the women, they are not representative of the current population and very high baseline fish intake in the Japanese population, et cetera, et cetera. So a trial was designed, which is very famous and you, many of our colleagues know, reduce it trial. I think this is the last what we are presenting. It was 8,000 patient, um, men and the women almost in the equal number. They were very well treated. The inclusion criteria were these patients because they were on the statins, so LDL cholesterol should be between 40 to 100, and the triglyceride should be between 135 to 499, and it was later on increased to 150. That was the cutoff for the triglyceride. And they should be having either established cardiovascular disease. So 70% of the patients in the reduce it were having established cardiovascular disease. They were more than 45 years of the age or they should be having diabetes mellitus with one, more, one or more than one uh, cardiovascular uh, risk factors. So they were equally divided. One is to one randomization into pure EPA, icosap and ethyl four gram per day versus the placebo and the primary composite endpoint, five point maze and the secondary composite endpoint was a three point maze. The trial was for, followed for a median of 4.9 year. And it showed that there was a highly statistically significant difference, relative risk reduction of about 25% in the primary composite endpoint and in the secondary composite endpoint, there was a 26% reduction. There was an absolute reduction of about 5% in the primary endpoint and about 3.6% absolute risk reduction. Number needed to treat was 21 and 28. So relatively less number required to treat to achieve one benefit. So if you see the individual components of the secondary endpoint, whether you see the stroke, fatal or non-fatal, myocardial infarction, fatal or non-fatal, cardiovascular death, all were statistically reduced, statistically significantly reduced. Another way of looking into the problem is, after the first episode of the problem, you don't want your patient to come second time. If he has come for the second time, you don't want him to come third time. Because every time they come, it every time the event happens in the same patient, it carries more mortality. So what they saw that uh, there was a 25% reduction in the first cardiovascular event, there was 32% reduction in the second cardiovascular event, 31% reduction in third cardiovascular event, and roughly 50% reduction in the fourth or more cardiovascular event in these patients. So the, all these things, they were highly significant in reduce it trial over there. 
So they, the trialists, uh, they had a very sensitive criteria for the adverse events over there. And what were the adverse events that they noted? The bleeding disorders. So, so the bleeding were much more in the uh, EPA group as compared to the placebo, but most of the bleeding, they were the minor bleedings in the form of the skin bruises. There were no increase in the gastrointestinal bleeding, no increase in the central nervous system or any other organ bleed. There was no increase in the hemorrhagic strokes also uh, over there. So the, all the bleeding, it comes as a minor bleeding over there in the reducing trial. But the main adverse event which was happening was there was a significant um, increase in the number of the atrial fibrillation. So, but when the atrial fibrillation events were analyzed in detail into the reduced trial, then it was seen most of the atrial fibrillation events were coming in the EPA arm from those patients who were having a pre-existing atrial fibrillation, means the paroxysmal, there were about 800 patients included in the reduced trial at the baseline who were known to have the paroxysmal atrial fibrillation. And these were the same patients who have the recurrent episodes of the atrial fibrillation more often into the EPA arm. Uh, the incidence of new onset atrial fibrillation in the EPA arm was only 0.6%, which was very low over there. And, uh, and uh, the number of the patients who had the serious atrial flutter or the fibrillation requiring hospitalization was not significant compared to the placebo over there. So just a few more slides. When this data of the reduced trial was seen into the diabetic patients, because uh, uh, roughly about 40%, uh, uh, I think 59% of the patients were the diabetic uh, into reduced trial, then whether you see the first event or the total event, these uh, are the uh, these are the first event in the light shade and the dark are the total events. You see there, you see either way there was a statistically significant difference between the EPA uh, and the placebo arm in the primary composite endpoint and the secondary composite endpoints. There are, the absolute risk reduction in the primary composite endpoint was about 10%. And it was for the first time it was happening like this. And like in the main trial, it was seen whether you see the first event, second event, or more than third event, all were highly statistically significantly reduced over there. So are all the effects of this EPA because of the triglyceride reduction, as many of us think? Uh, possibly not, because there was a moderate degree of the triglyceride lowering only, and the large relative and the absolute risk reduction in the several endpoint in the reduced trial, it seemed to exceed what is expected by the triglyceride lowering, suggesting that the other property of the EPA are likely contributing to the benefits. And the mechanistic studies, they suggest that the pure EPA, when it is used, it causes the plaque regression. And I am not going to cover it over here, but later on, with the pure EPA preparation, two more trials were conducted. One was with the use of the intravascular ultrasound, which was called as the CHERRY trial, and another was with the use of the um, um, multi-slice uh, uh, multi uh, coronary CT, uh, which is called as the evaporate trial. And both these trials, they have conclusively shown that pure EPA preparation over a period of only two years causes a significant plaque regression as compared to the placebo. So possibly uh, there are some other benefits. And, and this trial data got reflected into the guidelines. If you see the American Association of the Clinical Endocrinologist guidelines, which were published in 2017, then in the 2017, it showed uh, it, it, it has recommended the prescription omega-3 fatty acid, 2 to 4 grams per day. So there was absolutely no mention about the type of the omega-3 fatty acid 
They said it should be used to treat the severe hypertriglyceridemia, more than 500. Um, but now, if you see the American Association of the Clinical Endocrinologist Guidelines of the 2022, then it is specifically mentioned Icosapentethyl 4 gram per day if the triglyceride levels are elevated between 135 to 1499, and the patients who have been who are on maximally tolerated statin therapy. So many other guidelines, as the ADA guidelines, American Heart Association, NLA, National Lipid Association, and the European Atherosclerotic Society guidelines. The all the in the recent guidelines in the last three years. They recommend the pure EPA preparation to be used if you have to use it for either the prime for the for for, for cardiovascular protection in these patients. Now, only in the last slide, uh, because uh, it is considered that the omega-3 fatty acids uh, they are reducing the triglycerides uh, and uh, hypertriglyceridemia. So many of our Patients uh, of hypertriglyceridemia, they end up uh, uh, they end up with the endocrinologist because the hypertriglyceridemia is very prevalent in the diabetic patients. So adult patients, this is from the management of the hypertriglyceridemia guidelines, which were published by Salim Virani in 2021. Uh, in the adults with diabetes mellitus, aged more than 40 years. No atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, fasting triglyceride more than 150, or non fasting more than 175, and less than 500. So, what should we do? The first thing is optimum glycemic control. Because if the glycemic control is not good, then omega 3 fatty acids are not going to do anything. Even in the reduced trial, they did not include the patients whose glycosylated hemoglobin was more than 10%. So the glycosylated hemoglobin should be brought under control. Optimum, optimum, optimize the diet and the lifestyle over there. Maximize the statin therapy because the high intensity statin therapy like with atorvastatin and rosuvastatin, they are known to reduce the triglycerides by about 20 to 25% uh, over there. And then in those patients in whom in spite of all this, if the hyperdiaclyceridemia is persisting and they are having the cardiovascular risk factor, then you can consider using icosapentethyl. Why I'm showing you this slide is that in these guidelines, there, there is absolutely no role now for um, fibrates like the, uh, which used to be, which we used to use about five years back, the phenofibrate so commonly for the cardiovascular risk reduction or for hypertriglyceridemia, now the phenofibrate is out of the guidelines entirely over there. So the, what is the summary of this extensive evidence, what I have presented today is stop using EPA and DHA combination preparations, number one. Number two, Use the pure EPA preparation in the patients with triglycerides more than 150 milligram per deciliter, with diabetes and high risk of the cardiovascular events, and or the patient with atherosclerotic cardiovascular disease, where you have to use it for residual risk reduction if the triglycerides are still more than 150 in spite of the maximum tolerated statin therapy. And with this, I thank you very much. And thank you, Dr. Abdullah. Thanks the whole thank team you. and the audience to be there for patiently listening. Thank um, you very much, Dr. Sanjeev. Again. Very informative lecture indeed. But I am disappointed that Hamur is not healthy. Uh, Hamur <laughs> is very tasty. Mm. But it's not rich in omega-3. But you cannot... Say to your, you should not say to your patient. See the, see my, my point of bringing that in that slide both the things, uh, ESC guidelines of the 2012 and the ESC guidelines of 2021, and what you say casually to our patient, take fish, it's okay, and they take any fish, and then it is not okay. Uh, you know we have to 
tell them specifically now to take the oily fish. And I don't know how, I, I don't take fish. I don't know, Dr. Abdullah, you can tell us how, how tasty is the salmon for you. Well, I mean, most of our local fish is not included in the study. So I don't think there is a study like specifically for our local fish. But there is a couple of fishes there. Uh, or uh, For example, the mackerel, which is kingfish here, which we eat a lot. It's also not rich in omega-3. And uh, what else? The Spanish mackerel as well, which is the baby kingfish. It's also not rich in omega-3. That's the com common baby fish we eat. Baby kingfish is better. Uh, because, you know, mackerel, the problem with the mackerel, the, uh, the adult mackerel, they accumulate a lot of the methyl mercury. But yes. the baby one, they do not accumulate. If the fish is living very long, more methyl mercury. If living short, lesser methyl mercury. So what they say, if you want to take the uh, mackerel, take the smaller one mackerel. Okay, so just uh, we are out of time, but we have a couple of questions. We can go through them very quickly, Dr. Sanjeev. Sure, sure. So one, one question is uh, from Mr. Ibrahim. During pregnancy with very severe hypertriglyceridemia and risk for pancreatitis, using of omega-3 fatty acid is considered or we can use other option. I think this question can be subdivided into two questions. Like, would you recommend using omega-3 during pregnancy, giving the GI side effect? Um. So, you know, it's a uh, thank you very much. It's a very interesting question. Um, and the answer in brief will be something like this. So the use of omega-3 fatty acid is not contraindicated during pregnancy, number one. The use of the fish containing omega-3 fatty acid at one point of the time was not recommended during the pregnancy and early infancy because of the same risk of the methyl mercury. If you see the, what was the FDA recommendation in roughly about 2010-2012 uh, was against the consumption of the fish. But 2021 guidelines, uh, dietary guidelines issued by the US FDA says that no, no. Uh, um, after a study, it has been found that the fish, con fish consumption during the pregnancy is safe. You can take omega-3 fatty acid during the pregnancy also. So I think if there is severe hypertriglyceridemia, the treatment uh, should be the same as without pregnancy other than using the fibrates and the omega-3 fatty acids can be used during pregnancy and lactation. Okay, I think we will have the last question, then we will conclude the meeting. It's already 8 o'clock. So sure. any effect on CRP or coronary calcification scores? So effect on the high sensitivity CRP is reduced significantly. The, it has been seen in the strength trial with the mixture omega-3 fatty acid, the CRP was reduced. And it was seen in the reduced trial also that with the pure EPA preparation also the, uh, the, the CRP was significantly reduced. As far as the coronary calcification and the, uh, the coronary calcium, uh, with the improvement in the health, the further coronary calcification may not happen, but when the plaque regression happens, uh, the, the coronary calcification, it will not disappear. Whatever the calcium has accumulated, it remains over there in the plaque. Whether you take the uh, any sort of the therapy, rather with the statin therapy, the coronary calcium, it becomes much more denser uh, uh, in spite of the improvement in the lipid profile. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanjeev. I would like to thank the audience for joining us today. I know it's the weekend, but thank you very much to, to give us one hour of your time. And thank you very much, Dr. Sanjeev, to give this informative, very informative lecture indeed. And thank you to give us one hour of your valuable time during the weekend. Thank you very much. We can I appreciate please. that there have been so many people on the weekend. In the evening, they have come and joined us for this important discussion and the talk. And I thank everybody, including uh, Emirates Society of Internal Medicine and the team behind uh, of the ICOM who have uh, organized this without any problem and brought in so many people over there. Thank you, everybody. Have a very good, nice weekend. You too, Dr. Sanjeev. Thank you very much. Bye and good night. Good night, doctor.